It's a pleasure to be here. I did have some hope to be uh, giving a talk in that lovely library upstairs, but uh, I'm sure this is going to work out much better. Right. Um, I guess credit rating agencies or bond rating agencies, as they used to be known, uh, are a fascinating puzzle. Um, I guess largely unnoticed, as I say here. I, I, I remember when I first started to look at them, um, but I suppose before debt crises in the 1990s, a lot of people did react as, as if they were a rather boring topic. I have no problems on that score today. Um, we've had a whole series of crises involving the credit rating agencies. Uh, I guess in my book I start with the Orange County uh, of California crisis back in the early 1990s. Uh, and then of course Enron um, was uh, a very exciting event with all its special purpose vehicles and so on. Uh, uh, get its, getting itself fouled up over those back in 2001. And now of course the global financial crisis has made these institutions no notorious really. But I don't think all of these events have really increased public or, dare I say it, the policy uh, understanding of these institutions much. In fact, frankly, I think one of the astonishing things, maybe this is true of all researchers and universities, but one of the astonishing things for me has been to watch, I think, the level of futility in terms of debates in the US and in Europe about these agencies um, since the Enron event. I mean, it really is quite an astonishing black hole, I think, intellectually. Now, I think we can identify problems. Uh, my title is, after all, Problems with Credit Rating Agencies. We, I think we can identify problems with the agencies at a couple of levels, um, one of which I think is largely neglected. Much of the discussion of the agency's problems, I will contend, is not well founded. Uh, in conclusion, I'm going to suggest uh, that one interpretation of all the controversy over the agency's role in the crisis that we are still experiencing, I'm just looking at my uh, International Herald Tribune, who will comment about the future of Spain and the possible future of the Euro, so this crisis is not by any means over. Um, one interpretation uh, of the controversy over the agency's role in this business that is continuing uh, is that, they, that, that targeting the agency serves political ends, and I've written an article indeed to that effect. But despite all of this, despite all this hot air, all this noise, all this policy churning, despite the I don't know how many uh, uh, PDFs of reports, especially from the Europeans, I have um, downloaded and attempted to look at in the last three years. Uh, despite all the evidence at congressional committees in the United States, um, my contention remains that little substantive change will emerge. The business model won't be fundamentally changed, the analytical model will not be fundamentally changed. That may be consoling to you who, who think the state is an interfering nuisance in, in economics, or it may not be. <clears throat> Here's an outline of what I'm going to say. Let's start off with a little bit about where the agencies actually come from and what it is that I think they do. Then I'm going to talk about um, sort of process of capital market development, very briefly, and I guess financial innovation, which seems to me to be the background to our current excitement over the agencies. Then I'm going to talk about what I perceive to be the major um, key problems in the public debate about the agencies. Now, by, by no means am I comprehensive here. I'm not trying to get all of the... Um, uh, debates in the policy literature, all the debates in the academic literature, many of which are very interesting and thoughtful and substantial. Um, I'm trying to target, I suppose, the ones that seem to be motivating 
the policy system the most. I suppose that's a fair way to understand it, what I'm trying to do. Um, and these things have really made me quite angry because they do largely seem to me to be not very well conceived and yet very persuasive. It's, it's intriguing, isn't it, in academic life, how you, and policy life for that matter, how, how the most vacuous ideas sometimes become the most influential. We must charge for universities, but we must not charge somehow for primary schools or secondary schools. Hmm. Yeah, where do you draw the line between public goods and private goods? Nah, it's arbitrary, it seems. Perhaps not. Uh, after considering these key problems, I'm going to then, I'm then going to problematise the problems uh, with some discussion of them, and hopefully I will convince you, some of you, that uh, they are not very convincing. Um, then I'm going to do my own <coughs> account of problems, uh, problems two, then offer some conclusions and obviously there'll be further reading listed for those of you who wish to pursue this issue. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start off with, uh, with where the agencies come from and what it is I think that they actually do. Well, I mean, they are American institutions. First and foremost, and I appreciate that there are, there's now quite a feisty Chinese institution and there have certainly been institutions and in, uh, agencies in Japan and Malaysia and, uh, and so on for about 20, 25 years now. But in, you know, this, all this really comes from the US, New York City, unsurprisingly. Uh, it all starts, I think, really as a reflection of Western expansion of the United States. Uh, incredible opportunities for investors, typically, of course, European investors, British investors and continental investors, uh, who didn't have any knowledge of what was going on there. So, of course, data compendiums were produced by people like Henry Varnum Poor. And these, these compendiums really exist in the context of an information problem. The US government didn't have any reliable uh, data gathering, certainly in this part of the continental United States at the time, so, um, you know, again, there's, there is a kind of uh, vacuum, I think, that um, poor in particular is, is trying to fill. Now, um, in 1909, Moody's starts to issue ratings. Now, I should add here that uh, <laughs> Moody's first company actually goes bankrupt. You won't find this on Moody's Investors. Uh, web page. <laughs> uh, I think I discovered this in a speech by Moody that an ex-Moody's employee gave to me many years ago. Uh, but no, the first company went bankrupt in the 1907 financial crisis, a crisis similar in some respects to the crisis that we've just experienced. Um, and I think it was that crisis that really stimulated um, Moody to go for, to actually think about the issue of ratings themselves, to think about the, not just gathering data, as poor had, poor's had, but, uh, or standard statistics had, but to start to actually offer evaluations as well. That seems to me to be the crucial thing. Um, now, here's an important point. Okay, so we've got Moody's offering ratings in 1909, we've got S&P, Standard & Poor's offering them five, six, seven years later. Um, Interestingly, by the early 1920s, municipal bonds issued uh, in the United States must, in order to sell, in order to clear on the market, have a Moody's rating. Right? This is not a reflection of any state activity or government activity or anything of that, that nature. It is a reflection, I think, of um, <coughs> an efficient solution to a problem in the market. Uh, Moody's was offering that solution, and that really is the basis of Moody's franchise, I think. So for those of, uh, uh, <coughs> those of the sort of rating fraternity or rating academic fraternity who think that it was a, uh, a, a government rule in 1975 called the, uh, the NRSRO rule, Nationally Recognised Statistical Rating Organisation rule, um, that actually created the rating franchise, they need to read their history books because uh, you know, the whole rating system begins uh, in the municipal uh, world, the world of building bridges and dams and sewerage systems and things like that. And it, that is where uh, Moody's acquires um, 
its business, really, or builds its business. Uh, it doesn't happen in 1975. Mm -hmm. um, so to, I think to understand rating uh, uh, you know, as a, somehow a regulatory licence given by the state um, you know, fails to account for uh, the success early on. However, governments do indeed stimulate the process as we move forward in time. Uh, first example of that um, is in 1931 when I think the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency in the United States starts to require uh, pension funds to use ratings um, uh, in order to invest. And I could draw a distinction between speculative ratings and investment grade ratings. So, I mean, in a sense, the government starts to use and take advantage of this uh, already highly successful system um, <coughs> to deal with, obviously, some of the crises uh, and tensions that it, it was dealing with at the time, similar, I guess, to some of the crises and tensions we have to deal with right now. So I think that's a little bit about where the agencies come from and what, what it is they do. I mean, I guess, you know, um, they're big organisations to really to issue a bond unless you're Ferrari or, or you're some other name brand Italian uh, company in Europe, in most of developed Asia and certainly in North America one needs to have a credit rating. Um, I think certainly a beginning to understanding these institutions comes from a rationalist understanding of what they do, that they help to solve an information problem right, between buyers and sellers in markets, capital markets. Um, but I think there's more to the story and hopefully I'll be able to illustrate that. I think there is a, um, a constructed or uh, orchestrated side to this as well. It's not simply, uh, <coughs> it's not simply like a uh, part that one would stick into one's car to fix. It's not simply a functional argument. There's also um, an historical and, um, I don't know, behavioural dimension to all of this. There is, of course, an, a third rating agency founded at this time called Fitch Ratings, but I haven't really talked about this very much for the, for the simple reason that it's not very successful. Yeah. And it's not very successful, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't achieve the same uh, level of eminence or authority that Moody's and S&P uh, achieve very quickly, and, uh, you know, I would argue has never, they have never achieved that. So there is, I think, in this um, story a lot to be said about the issue of authority and knowledge. Um, it's not simply, as I say, a functional account of fulfilling or sort of solving some sort of problem. You can solve that problem well, you can solve it badly. You can solve it well if you're Moody's and you can f be perceived to solve it less well if you're Fitch and therefore be less successful. Right, now disintermediation. I think this is where a lot of our difficulties come from, not just in relation to rating agencies, but in relation to finance generally. Um, we're all used to dealing with banks, and we think banks are very important and meaningful institutions. However, I would suggest to you that they aren't really. Uh, uh, institutions that we call banks today increasingly aren't the banks that our grandparents knew. And that's because we all are living through a period in which direct financing or financing from capital markets has become increasingly important. And direct uh, financing from banks to corporates to governments is just so ridiculously expensive and unattractive that either the banks offered as a loss leader and don't make any money on it at all, or they're only able to uh, make loans to very poor credits. And of course, lending to poor credits encourages good credits even further to go elsewhere because not only do they have to pay for the cost of the bank, they have to pay for the cost of all the bad loans that the bank has made.